What do these five people have in common? To go down the list, this one, despite being in his late team, seems to function with the sensibility of a child. This one has an extreme inferiority complex which drives him to commit heinous crime. This one is a serial killer. This one killed himself. And this one... Well, actually, he's not that bad. Mostly just a shut-in who isn't afraid to kill people. All five of these characters, in some way or another, showcase attributes of psychological issues. But they have one more thing in common. They all come from the same orphanage. Whammy's House. Death Note is a critically acclaimed show that depicts the cat and mouse game between its main characters, Ellen Light. But what we're going to be talking about today took a backseat to the plot. The idea of Whammy's House, an orphanage for genius children, was only introduced deep into the series after the character L died. The anime consists of 37 episodes. In this orphanage, the origin story for our main antagonist doesn't appear until the 26th episode. In that episode, we're introduced to two of the five characters I mentioned earlier, Nier and Mello. And shortly after, we're introduced to a third, Matt. All three of these characters are children of the orphanage, and were meant to be successors to the character L. While that idea remains relevant to the story and pivotal to not only the plot as a whole, but individual character motivations specifically for Mello, it isn't necessarily explored very deep. Not until a novel was released after the series ended called Death Note Another Note. You may have noticed at the beginning of the video, two of the five characters did not have actual pictures, just the letters A and BB. That's because these characters did not appear in either manga or anime. The story of A killing himself and BB becoming a serial killer are only detailed in the prequel novel. Death Note Another Note is a story about the Los Angeles BB murder cases, which serves two purposes. One, it tells us the story about how Naomi, Misora, and Elle work together for the first time. And two, it gives us insight on how the idea of being a successor to the world's greatest detective can affect one's mental psyche. A and BB are part of what has become known as the first generation of Elle's successors. Whammy's house, seemingly from a very early stage, has existed for the purpose of molding children's minds to create the perfect genius, one with a cognizance that could live up to Elle. It's not unreasonable to think that the pressure from being raised for the sole purpose of becoming one of the smartest people in the world is enough to cause some sort of mental disturbance. While the three successors that appeared in the manga and anime may have had it easy compared to their serial killer and self-killed prototypes, they are most certainly not unaffected. Nier's childlike behavior can be seen as a minor quirk, or it can be seen as him never being given the chance to mature and grow as a human being. He is almost always seen playing with toys and other simple games. As stated in the canon guidebook, Death Note How to Read, he's very codependent and requires support from those around him. Milo plays the role of a rebellious teen, but considering his situation is ten times more demanding than what most teens would face in the real world, it's only natural that instead of underage drinking or smoking pot, his acts of rebel are also ten times more dramatic, such as joining a high-scale criminal organization. Even catching Kira in his own way was just an act of rebellion. It wasn't the sense of bringing justice that motivated him, but just proving that he didn't need the orphanage or near to be the best. Of the three, Matt seems to be the best off, but his behavior towards killing and spying shouldn't be ignored. Despite the gravity of the situation he was in, he got distracted easily and never seemed to take things as serious as they probably should have been taken. Such as his famous death scene, where, when encountered by a number of armed gunmen, he plays it cool with a clever quip, an attempt at reaching for his own gun. I wouldn't go as far as to say this is a mental illness, but the disconnect between his perspective and reality is there. When I originally thought of the idea for this video, the first real-world equivalent I related this to was K-pop. K-pop and the system they use to manufacture idols is one that buries young children in deep, deep expectations and pressures. However, fortunately for my limited knowledge of the industry, we haven't seen any K-pop stars snapping and going Columbine on everyone. That said, there is another real-world parallel here, one that has had actual negative consequences. Look no further than popular sports, and you'll find countless athletes who fall victim to mental trouble. In 2015, a biopic came out about Dr. Bennett Omalu and his fight with the NFL to bring this issue to awareness. Now on the surface, Dr. Omalu was working on the issue of concussion, but it went deeper than that. Yes, these athletes were sustaining extreme physical injuries, but those stem from intense pressure being placed on them. Football is a contact sport. You do not play this game without some sort of violence. And with that expectation, when you do receive injuries, barring the breaking of bones, you are just expected to continue to play. Football is undeniably America's favorite sport. I've grown up with kids who have been playing football since elementary school. To them, football is life. Everything else can take the back seat. For a lot of these kids, their futures ride on that. They sacrifice education to practice, and if they can't get an athletic scholarship, they have nothing else to rely on. With that level of pressure put on someone, the all or nothing mentality, it makes sense why people like Andre Waters, dead at 44, Mike Webster, dead at 50, Terry Long, dead at 45, Dave Dewerson, dead at 50, Justin Strelzik, dead at 36, and Junior Seo, dead at 43, all they know is to keep playing. Near the end of his biopic, there's an interesting speech where Dr. Amalu says that it's not his goal to stop football. His intentions, when researching the dangers of the game, were only to bring attention to exactly that, the dangers of the game. And I think that segues nicely back into Death Note. What I find interesting about the idea of Whammy's house, L, and Watsuri is that they actually aren't bad people. They act on what they believe is right. 
what's needed. Watsuri is not manufacturing L replacements because he's an evil mastermind. L does not want a successor because of an egotistical legacy. One can argue that the world needs L. Kira's values and the world he wanted to create were dangerous, and without L or Nier or Mello or Matt, I can't imagine how they could have stopped him. And in the future, when the world needs a brilliant mind, they'll look to the orphanage. So is Whammy's house a necessity?